Everyone, it's great seeing you again, and thanks for joining us for Monday's edition of Alaska Weather, 15th day of February 20, 2021. I'm Dave Percy, a meteorologist with the National Weather Service, and I'll be hosting today's show. How's this weather graphic? Uh, a couple of areas here. Uh, there's winter weather advisory out for the uh, greater Galena area, and that's out, uh, let's see, until 6 p.m. Wednesday. Next couple of days, uh, expecting uh, snow and blowing snow to increase uh, and uh, resulting in visibilities less than a quarter mile with the gusty winds and a little bit of uh, new snow expected, but uh, not too much. And then a wind chill advisory out for St. Lawrence Island for until uh, noon tomorrow. Wind chills 45 degrees below zero with 30 to 45, maybe gusts 50 miles an hour in those northeast winds. Otherwise, no watches, warnings, or advisories anywhere else around the state uh, for the next day or so as uh, jet stream well to the south of the area and leaving a weakening low there in the Bering Sea, kind of the uh, classic Aleutian low pattern uh, spinning there just north of the uh, east central Aleutians there south of the Pribilofs and uh, bringing rain across the eastern Aleutians and uh, lighter amounts across the Alaska Peninsula today. Rainfall amounts weren't all that much, uh, generally less than a quarter of an inch out that way in the last 12 hours. And also with that band of moisture pulling up into Cook Inlet, not much with that at all as well. Uh, Iliamna had a little bit of snow, anywhere maybe a half inch to an inch in that general area there around Iliamna Lake and then areas of light snow over the southwest interior up into the Cuscombe Valley and then kind of extending up along and south of the Yukon River Valley but again really light amounts nothing more than an inch and less than that in most other areas and cold air back in over the north slope this afternoon that's why it's showing up white not so much because of the cloudiness because the ground's so cold and uh, dry over the northern panhandle clouds and a few isolated uh, rain or snow showers over the southern southeast coast not much going on there this afternoon as well. And uh, rolling that through again, you can see that uh, what was a pretty good front a uh, day or so ago now really washed out over the interior here and Northern Bering Sea and that low continues to weaken and uh, slow moving, but gradually will kick off to the east a little bit over the next couple of days. And on the chart, uh, Arctic high pressure and over the North Slope, about 1,023 millibars, nothing like what we'd seen a few days ago uh, up there with those pressures or a week ago even. And the low pressure, 976 millibars, uh, Lucian low there, uh, just north of the chain, southwest of the Pribilofs. That uh, brings some gusty winds to the area there. Uh, let's see. Well, actually, starting up north there, you can see the pretty tight gradient along the northwest coast, western Arctic coast, Point Hope seeing gusts about 40 miles an hour this afternoon. And uh, Gamble seeing gusts 52 miles an hour a couple hours ago. So still pretty windy there. And... Uh, then the areas of uh, light snow along what uh, didn't even draw it in as a frontal boundary and it was so weak, but just some leftover moisture there, areas of light snow into the Yukon Delta Coast and along the Yukon River into the lower valley there and extending up uh, toward uh, Galena and then southward into the Cuscombe Valley, uh, light amounts of snow all the way down into uh, northern Bristol Bay and again a little more measurable around Iliamna Lake uh, from the amounts I saw reported, uh, but even that was again uh, maybe an inch or so and or less and some of the moisture getting into southern Cook Inlet and trying to reach the southern Kenai Peninsula otherwise uh, mostly clear and fair with light winds Copper River Basin eastern interior areas northern interior as well uh, just a few clouds along the Arctic coast and north slope areas uh, with uh, temperatures well below zero and then some snow showers mostly earlier today kind of tapered off this afternoon mixed with rain over the southern southeast coast and for tonight uh, again a trough extending into the interior there from the southwest coast actually from that low center continues to weaken really quasi stationary doesn't move much 984 millibars and now uh, bring an area of light snow maybe some blowing and drifting snow again into the uh, Galena area with some light snow possible into the Tanaw Valley snow showers possible uh, Cook Inlet Kenai Peninsula 
Manuska in the Valley and uh, North Gulf Coast, Prince William Sound drying out somewhat. Not that you had a lot <laughs> going currently over the panhandle. There's a risk of some shower activity and that's about it. No change out over the Bering Sea. And uh, that low continues to weaken, but it kind of generates another front uh, tomorrow. Not a real strong one, but you can see the gradient enough to uh, kick the winds up, possibly a gale force there in advance of that frontal boundary. And then an area of uh, light snow, kind of a widespread area of light snow from the southwest coast all the way up into the upper Yukon Valley now, Porcupine River, Kobuk, or the uh, eastern Kobuk Valley, Koyukuk Valley, areas of light snow. Snow showers down across Manuska, Susitna Valley, northern Cook Inlet, uh, rain or snow right along the outer coastline, both of the North Gulf Coast and Panhandle. Outlook for Wednesday, that front pushes inland with an area of snow from northern Cook Inlet, south central Alaska, pushing up into the interior across the uh, Cuscombe Valley. A couple of bands extending north and dissipating, and rain and snow north Gulf Coast, chance of snow over the Panhandle, and that low really weakening now as it shifts into Bristol Bay. Lows for tonight, single numbers northern Panhandle to near 30 south, uh, below zero again in the Copper River Basin. Uh, 5 to 10 below there for the Tanaw Valley, but uh, colder all the way up to the Arctic Coast North Slope, closer to 40 below. And then uh, below zero St. Lawrence Island, mid 30s there for the uh, Pribilofs and Eastern Aleutians. And for the highs tomorrow, nudging above zero there, Galena, Copper River Basin, and lower 40s, uh, central and southern Panhandle, upper 20s in the north, near 40, Kodiak Island, mid 20s, south central Alaska. And below zero now from the northern interior out to the Arctic Coast, Tanaw Valley up above zero, uh, maybe 20 degrees there at Delta and Healy with upper 30s to near 40 out over the Aleutians and Bering Sea. And the lows Wednesday morning uh, below zero, but not too far for the Copper River. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. Weather for uh, Tuesday morning, we've got uh, some IFR on the central Arctic coast there, pretty localized right along Point Barrow area, give or take uh, a few miles either east or west. And then down over the uh, central Brooks Range, mostly on the north side of the uh, crest of the mountains there, south of the mountains, OVFR, Seward Peninsula, northern Bering Sea, Chuxi Sea, eastward across the upper Yukon Valley, and southward across the upper Tanah Valley, 40 mile country into the Copper River Basin. IFR, though, uh, increasing Kodiak Island into southern Cook Inlet, Kenai Peninsula. North Gulf, yeah, Prince William Sound, actually even uh, across the Manuska Valley, and IFR pretty widespread out over the Bering Sea with a band extending in from Nunavak Island and across the Yukon Delta into the lower Yukon Valley into the central interior. Uh, panhandle, areas of marginal VFR with areas of VFR. And for the, uh, let's see, you get the cursor in the right spot there. There we go. Uh, for the afternoon Tuesday, IFR Central Arctic Coast and the Central North Slope with some marginal VFR surrounding that area and then VFR south of the mountains into the northern Bering Sea, including St. Lawrence Island, good VFR. A band of marginal VFR along with some IFR, mostly along the Yukon River Valley area from the Delta and Nunavak Island right on up uh, to the Porcupine River. And then a uh, narrow band of uh, VFR along and just north of the central Alaska range, a little more widespread over the 40 mile country, Northway Toke Eagle looking pretty good as well as uh, North Pole and uh, Salsa. Fairbanks marginal, south of the Alaska range, marginal VFR, some IFR in the Susitna Valley, IFR Southern Cook Inlet, Kamishak Bay, Kodiak Island, marginal for the North Gulf Coast and Panhandle, and uh, Pribilofs IFR, and some of that extending down toward Atka, otherwise mostly in the Bering Sea with the Aleutians marginal. And for the uh, afternoon Tuesday, t uh, we've got some IFR there along the uh, Central Arctic Coast area, and still some, or let me move to, uh, let me get the right, uh, there we go. There we are, Wednesday morning. <laughs> Pribilofs, IFR, Eastern Aleutian, Southeast Bering, and the narrow band up along the uh, southern coast of the Norton Sound area across the Nolato Hills. It expands a little bit there uh, over the Yukon Flats and Brooks Range, some IFR over the Arctic coast. And also widespread IFR, Gulf of Alaska up to the North Gulf Coast, eastern slopes of the Alaska Range, eastern slopes of the Cuscoe Mountains, all of Bristol Bay, Togiak Bay, Pribilofs to uh, Unmak Island, and other band of IFR coming into the western Aleutians, and IFR uh, over the uh, southern half of the Panhandle, marginal to the north. And there we go, Wednesday afternoon. IFR, again, the North Gulf Coast, up from the Gulf of Alaska, and into the Southern Copper River Basin, Yakutat, uh, Elfin Cove, uh, Lincoln Isle Glacier Bay, IFR, marginal VFR down to about Port Alexander, and then VFR, the remainder of the Panhandle, marginal for Kodiak Island, a widespread area of IFR from the Southwest Interior. Actually, the Alaska Range crosses South Central Cuscombe Valley, Yukon Delta, all of Bristol Bay, 
along the Alaska Peninsula, Fox Islands, Pribloss, IFR, but VFR, northern bearing, the northern bearing there, St. Lawrence Island, Seward Peninsula, and the northwest interior, VFR, and the western Aleutians, not too shabby. And for passes, Anatuvik, uh, possible IFR in the northern entrance of both Anatuvik and Adigan, lowest conditions for the Brooks Range there will be on the north side and uh, otherwise marginal. And for Lake Clark and Merrill, IFR, eastern entrance, otherwise marginal. And rainy, occasionally marginal tomorrow with uh, windy. Marginal VFR possible in the southern entrance. Otherwise, I think it'll stay VFR uh, out the north side. And Isabel, same pattern. Marginal VFR in the pass and south, but VFR out the north entrance. Mintasta, possible marginal VFR southern entrance. Otherwise, VFR. And Tanita, marginal VFR, portage, pretty marginal. Chilkoot and White, start out VFR becoming marginal throughout the day. And the freezing levels uh, north of the Pribilos across northern Bristol Bay, hugging the North Gulf Coast and then cutting uh, a little bit farther inland, but not too far into the Panel, 2,000 feet well south of the area. Icing, just some possible areas of considerable moderate there for the Alaska Peninsula, otherwise not too significant in those other areas. And for the jet stream, the main jet well south of the area there, as you can see, and uh, 9,000 feet, southerlies 50 knots approaching Kodiak, westerlies 40 knots up over the northeast interior, but Bering Sea not too bad wind-wise, although at 3,000 feet, 40 to 50 knot winds over the Chukchi Sea in northern Bering. And uh, turbulence uh, looks like uh, pretty choppy there for the Shelikov Strait area, Kodiak Island with the southeast winds, Alaska Peninsula, western Alaska Peninsula, moderate chop as well as uh, the central Aleutian areas. Otherwise, the panhandle in the interior looking pretty good, pretty smooth, but still moderate chop there. Kivalina, Point Hope, and light isolated moderate to western St. Lawrence Island. And after the break, I'll be back with the marine forecast. I can't really name anyone that has so much integrity as she does to the things that she's accomplishing. It's pretty amazing. Having Claire as a role model, just a strong woman in science and just so smart and so kind. It's just a huge confidence booster is that, hey, I could do that too, you know? That's, that's possible, that's successful, that's what I want to do. I would characterize her as a pioneer in the field. The amount and uh, quality of the work she's put out is, is uh, second to none. I know people who have a lot of tenacity. I know people that have integrity, but it's rare that people have both together in that you know, that combination that Claire does. Every morning, Dr. Claire Parkinson gets up before sunrise and runs two miles to work. She hasn't missed a day in nearly 40 years. To know the evolution of sea ice and how we observe it from space is to know Claire. This year, she's celebrating 40 years at NASA. When I arrived at Goddard, which was in July of 1978, it was an incredibly exciting period here. Satellites were pretty new, but a lot of data had been collected. NASA scientists were inundated with information, and Claire was in a cohort looking at sea ice, trying to make sense of a jumble of very raw, very new data. It was around that time that Claire and her team, at the time led by Dr. Jay Zwally, created the principal sea ice record that we use today. How does something like that record help you do your job? Oh, <laughs> that record is fundamental to understanding sea ice. So without it, we wouldn't know how rapidly it's changing. You may not realize it, but Claire's work studying the changing extent of the ice caps deeply affected our understanding of climate change, and relatedly, our understanding of how climate change affects life on Earth. One of the clearest 
signals for climate change that uh, resonates with people has been this shrinking of the polar ice cap in the summer that we're able to see because of uh, Claire's work. After we had a record that was about 15, 20 years long, we started noticing that the extent of the ice in the Arctic was getting smaller over time. Sea ice is formed on the surface of the ocean and therefore is made from seawater. The biggest concentration is in the Arctic, and it's also where the biggest loss in sea ice is occurring. Every year, NASA reports on the sea ice minimum and maximum extents. As expected, the data is concerning. By now, not only has this trend toward lesser ice continued, but it's even accelerated so that now the decreases are greater than what they had been. These trends are deeply troubling, but one thing's for sure. Our awareness of shrinking sea ice extent due to climate change was propelled faster and further after Claire Parkinson arrived at NASA. I mean, she takes her job seriously and the health and welfare of those instruments in space, yeah, she's, she's on it, you know? It's uh, one of the things you don't worry about because Claire's in the loop on these things. It's, it's gonna be fine. In science, we stand on the shoulders of giants, on the shoulders of those who explored before us. But then, some among us are giants. For a scientist, it's incredibly exciting to be studying these glaciers and ice sheets right now because they're doing something that hasn't happened in thousands of years. We're watching changes take place that haven't happened since the end of the last ice age. Tuesday was cold, I almost froze my toes. Oh, what's it gonna be next week? Who knows, that's climate. Oh, that's the climate you got. You take a bunch of weather and you average it together and you're doing the climate rock. glacial pace. It means something's happening so slowly you can barely tell it's happening at all. That used to describe the very incremental movement glaciers and ice sheets experienced each year. But now that's changing. We're tagging along with three NASA scientists to understand the different lengths they go to to not only investigate ice sheets and glaciers, but also communicate their often complicated science to the public. First, let's get oriented. Ice sheets, in pink, pretty much occur in only two places, Antarctica and Greenland. Glaciers in yellow play a key role draining melt off the ice sheet. Glaciers are also found in the high mountains, but we'll get to those in another episode. So we know that something's happening in Greenland right now that's unprecedented in the last several thousand years. That's Dr. Josh Willis, oceanographer at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Josh and his team are tackling one of the major environmental challenges of the 21st century, trying to answer fundamental questions about how melting glaciers impact sea level rise. With my mission, Oceans Melting Greenland, or OMG for short, we're trying to understand just how much of Greenland's melt is caused by the oceans. Along with being one of NASA's top scientists working on the cryosphere, Josh is passionate about demystifying climate change in typically unconventional ways. I think by reaching out to people with a little bit of humor, a little bit of fun, maybe a song, you really have the opportunity to help people understand and come to terms with what we're doing to our planet. Because it's definitely happening and it's definitely a big deal and we need to start preparing for it. Down at the opposite pole, Dr. Kelly Brunt is getting ready for a major expedition. In December and January this coming year, uh, I'll actually be in Antarctica down near the South Pole collecting ground-based GPS data. 
This is actually Kelly's second expedition to the South Pole. The first occurred in December and January of last year. Both surveys are critical and will help validate data collected by NASA's airborne campaign, Operation Icebridge, and the recently launched satellite mission ISAT-2. All three of these layers, that ground base, that airborne, and the satellite are all tied together. The ground base helps validate both the satellite and the airborne, and the airborne helps give us more validation data for the satellites, but also a bigger story with respect to the depth of the ice sheet and what's going on underneath the surface. While some scientists are taking measurements in the fields, others are looking for answers in physics and lines of code. For me, the, the projections that we, that we are doing, they do have a, a very personal meaning. Dr. Sophie Nowicki is an ice sheet modeler. That means she and her team have the important job of forecasting how ice will change in the future, which also predicts changes in sea level rise. It's a job she doesn't take lightly, especially since urban planning and infrastructure use her team's models to make decisions about the future and safety of their communities. When we make those projections that are 100 years in the future, 100 years can seem so far away, like I don't have to worry about it, it's just too far. But actually they are not. It's really like the future that we are looking at that our children, our grandchildren will see to experience. Whether it's learning to communicate in new ways, traversing a swath of Antarctica in a massive piston bully, or taking responsibility for an impactful climate forecast, our NASA explorers are pushing the limits of discovery every day. But on a very human level, there are people with families and friends who have a stake in finding out why and how the planet is changing as rapidly as it is. Every place, at least so far, that we have found life, we found water along with it. And so when we try to understand uh, the thresholds for life, where life might exist, elsewhere in our solar system and the universe. Water is one of those things that we look for. And now, marine weather around Alaska. Welcome back. Uh, sea ice analysis here in Northern Bering Sea. We've got the uh, heavier pack ice down to uh, St. Matthew Island on the North Shore there with the thinner stuff to the south. And uh, continuing to expand on the thinner ice there, uh, of, along the Yukon Delta coast, north side of Nunavak Island, south side of the Seward Peninsula with those strong northerly winds, uh, that's pretty typical uh, for with the north winds being that strong to have the thinner ice on the south side of the island. Anyway, Bristol Bay, uh, kind of variable on the heavier ice, seems to be uh, actually diminishing a little bit. Not much change for Cook Inlet. And for the Tulsa water forecast, uh, west winds 20 knots along the coast tomorrow. Uh, Seas running 12 to 13 feet, and for the central and southern inside waters, south to southeast, 15 knots, three to six foot seas. Lynn Canal uh, down to 10 knots from the south, or variable. The seas uh, pretty slight at two feet. I'll look for Wednesday, Lynn Canal, southeast 15, Stevens Passage, southeast 20 with four foot seas. Small craft visors for Clarence Strait, southeast increasing to 25 knots, seas building to five feet. Gale warnings all along the coast. On the south coast, 35 knots out of the southeast, seas 20 feet. On the north coast, 35 to 40 knots with uh, 11 16 foot seas. And for uh, Prince William Sound, Northern Cook Inlet, light northeast winds tomorrow at 10 knots with slight seas. Uh, Southern Cook Inlet, northeast 15, east 15, Kamishak Bay, Barren Island, south 15, north Gulf Coast, uh, not too bad. Southwest 15, 7 to 8 foot seas. Outlook for Wednesday, big increase in those winds, especially Prince William Sound. You got gale warnings flying for Tuesday, or for, I'm sorry, for Wednesday. East winds 35 knots, sea 7 feet, southeast 35 for the eastern north Gulf Coast there across uh, Middleton Island, southeast 30 for the western north Gulf Coast. Small craft advisors of Barron Island, southeast 25 knots, southern Cook Inlet, gale warnings, Kamishak Bay, gale warnings, north to northeast winds 35 knots, 8 to 10 foot seas, and 20 knot winds north of the Forelands. And for Kodiak Island, southerlies 15 to 20 tomorrow, 3 to 10 foot seas. Bristol Bay, southeast at 20. Small craft advisories there on the Bering Sea side of the Alaska Peninsula. Uh, southeast 25 knots, southeast 25 also for the Alaska Peninsula. In fact, from Cape Sarachev all the way up to Sitkanak, southeast 30 knots, 11 to 13 foot seas. West winds 20 knots for the, for the peninsula on Alaska Peninsula on Wednesday. Seas 4 to 10 feet heavy or highest, of course, on the Bering Sea side of the peninsula. East winds 15 for Bristol Bay with two foot seas and uh, 
Kodiak Island, southwest, uh, 15 to 20 knots, back to Castle Cape. And the uh, Western Aleutians from Kiska to Shimia, northwest 20 knots, small craft advisors on Chitka Island, northwest 30 knots. Gale warnings for Adak and Atka, northwest 35 knots. And then Alaska Island, south to southeast, 25 knots. And uh, Nikolsky, north 20 on the north side, south 30 on the south side there, Unmak Island. And then for Wednesday, Gale warnings, western Aleutians, south winds 35 knots, Shimmy at Akiskam, Chitka, westerly gales at 35 knots, small craft advisories, Adak and Atka, west northwest, 25 to 30 knots. And for the Fox Islands, uh, west to northwest, uh, call it 20 to 30 knots, with seas running 6 to 11 feet. Southwest coast, uh, east 20 there along the Cuscomb Delta coastline with five foot seas. About the same for the Pervilofs. Gale warnings though, St. Matthew Island. Gale warnings for the St. Lawrence Island area, sustained 35 knot winds from the north. And brisk wind advisory for the Yukon Delta for northeast winds at 25 knots. And then for Wednesday, 30 knot winds from the north. Uh, brisk wind advisory, St. Lawrence Island, Yukon Delta coast. Small craft advisories for St. Matthew Island. Otherwise, 20 knot winds from the north of the Pervilofs and along the Cuscomb Delta coast. Brisk wind advisory is Norton Sound, north at 30. And for the uh, eastern Beaufort Sea coast, light winds out of the west, 5 to 10 knots. Light winds on the central and, north, or central and west coast as well, north at 10. Then brisk wind advisories, Cape Beaufort to Wales, 25 to 30 knots out of the north. And for Wednesday, Wales to Cape Beaufort, north winds 25 knots. That's good for small or brisk wind advisories. North 15, western Arctic coast, uh, south 10 on the central coast. Turn westerly as you get toward demarcation point, but holding at about 10 knots. And for tonight, uh, high pressure up that way. We'll keep it winds light. Could be a few flurries, patchy areas of fog along the eastern Beaufort Sea coast. Do that very weak trough kind of sneaking over the top of that ridge. A little bit more pronounced area of light snow from... Uh, say the Fairbanks area, actually almost into the 40 mile country toward Eagle, just to risk of some flurries there. And there is a snow and blowing snow with the uh, winter weather advisory out uh, for the uh, Galena area and the wind chill advisory till uh, tomorrow for the St. Lawrence Island, Bering Strait Coast, 45 degrees below zero with gusty winds starting to diminish though, unsettled there over the Bering Sea and the illusions of that persistent low. Rain and snow on the increase along the North Gulf Coast, chance of snow over Southern Cook Inlet. And that's all I've got time for. Thanks for joining. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbormaster before you go boating.